I know. I know I need a haircut. I've been busy. I was in Home Depot a little while back and this, uh, this mom was holding this little girl in her arms. She's probably three. And I kind of made awkward eye contact with him. And the girl whispered something to her mom and her mom started laughing. And I got self-conscious. I'm like, what? What'd I do to you, little girl? <laughs> so I just kind of do my thing. And the mom comes up to me and she's still laughing. She goes, I have to tell you what my little girl said. It's like, okay. She said, uh, my little girl looked over at me and she said, mom, you see that man over there? He looks a little bit like God. <laughs> I said, Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> I didn't really say that, I promise. <laughs> but that's why we're here. We want to look a little bit more like God, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're studying these five different cultures, a culture of prayer, a culture of the word, a culture of togetherness culture of excellence, you're worried. <laughs> and today we're doing a culture of development. Okay, that's rooted in Colossians 1, 28. Y'all have read it a hundred times. But it says, him we proclaim. Jesus, him we proclaim. Warning everyone. And teaching everyone. So that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's the development piece. Okay, now, the warning everyone is not fun. That's not the fun. When Aaron was talking, he said, sometimes conflict is necessary. Well, that's today. And I, <laughs> I have to be the one to do the conflict. And God has given me a word, and I have prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give me a different word. Because I want to be like the happy guy that when y'all leave, you're like, that guy's awesome. <laughs> Tell funny jokes and funny stories. Because I, I have lots of funny jokes and funny stories. That's what I want you to leave saying. But this is not the message for that. You're just going to have to trust me. I'm pretty awesome. Can we start there? <laughs> Just trust me. I'm stalling. Have you ever had somebody say something to you and they're joking, but there's something in their joke that kind of stings? We were, uh, I was still playing with Chris and we had recorded a record and uh, we were back here in town and we were needing to rehearse so we could learn how to play the songs that we just recorded so we could go out on tour. And the, the Stone didn't have this building yet, so we had to use a, a, a church across town called Promised Land. You know who Randy Phillips is from Phillips, Craig, and Dean? I know, I'm a name dropper. <laughs> So Randy Phillips is pastor of Life Austin. He's in Phillips, Craig, and Dean. His dad is a pastor of Promised Land. And so we borrowed Promised Land so we could rehearse. And we were in there. We'd just come back from Nashville, and we're working on learning how to play these songs. And Randy walks in. Randy's country. He's real country, which I love. It's endearing to me. He walks in. He goes, well, you boys been up in Nashville worshiping that golden calf? We we're like, how? <laughs> it kind of stung a little bit. We don't want to admit that it stings a little bit, right? But it stings a little bit. Because the Bible says about itself in Hebrews 4.12 that it's alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword sharp enough to pierce between the division of joint and marrow, between soul and spirit. 
It's alive and active. So when we read a story like the golden calf, it's easy for us to read it and go, (laughs) those dumb Israelites. But it's really not the story of the Israelites, it's our story. It's the story of how quickly we can take our eyes off of worshiping the living God and shift them onto worshiping something that we created. That's where we're going today, just so you know. We're answering the question, and I'm asking the question of you, when you're developing your people, are you developing them to be worshipers of the living God, or are you developing them to be worshipers of worship? Because our generation is really teetering on this. So as a warning, we need to address it. You know the story of the golden calf. We all know the story. But I want us to read it today together and ask ourselves, how close are we to this line? Okay? Because you all know the story. The Israelites were all in captivity, right? And Moses comes up, let my people go, that whole thing. They leave. First of all, just get in your head that there's over a million people. It's not like 200 people. There's over a million people leaving, exiting, thus the exodus. (laughs) They're leaving. Pharaoh comes behind them. They see, I want you to hear this, they see with their eyes, Moses put his staff in the Red Sea and it parts and over a million people walks through the middle of the Red Sea on dry land. Soon as they're safe, in behind them. They saw that. They saw God lead them in the day by a pillar of cloud. They saw God lead them in the night by a pillar of fire. They saw it, okay? We see God do things. We've seen God move amazing, okay? So we're not different from them at this point. So you come to Mount Sinai, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna read it, because you gotta get the, like Aaron said, you gotta get the flannel graph out of your head. I want you to just get this. If you have your Bible, just go ahead and turn to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Moses had, God had told Moses that he's going to show up in three days and the people need to consecrate themselves. And they have to put a boundary around the mountain because God said, when I come, if anybody touches the mountain, they're going to die. This is a big deal. So on the morning of the third day, look at 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings. First thing you can figure out right there is grammar. I thought that the plural of thunder and lightning was thunder and lightning. (laughs) Like moose or deer. It's not. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings. You can learn all kinds of stuff from this. <laughs> Get this in your head. And a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Okay, they'd seen him. Now they're going to meet him. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder and Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up and guess what? All the people saw it. They saw it with their eyes. Moses was up on the mountain for 13 chapters of your Bible. 
40 days he was on top of the mountain. And he wasn't just getting the Ten Commandments written on the tablets. God created the universe in six days. It didn't take him 40 days to write Ten Commandments on two stone tablets. <laughs> they weren't big chief tablets writing, do not kill. <laughs> Moses was up there getting the entire law and the Torah and what Aaron was talking about, he was getting the blueprint for the tabernacle, details that Moses could give to Bezalel. Remember we talked about this, culture of excellence? He was up there for 40 days. Moses was meeting with God. And the people saw it. So we come to the golden calf. That's over in uh, 32. You can flip over there, 13 chapters later. 32 starting in one. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and they brought them to Aaron and Aaron received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with a graving tool and he made a golden calf. Moses is meeting with God right there. And Aaron made a golden calf. So really, this story is not so much about the idolatry of the Israelites. This story is about leadership. Because this isn't the first time that the Israelites had complained. Right? They were a complaining people. We are a complaining people. This is our story. It's a question of leadership. Let's just look at it just really fast. So the people had just come out of the Red Sea. They saw God split the sea, right? They get three days into the wilderness. Three days. Three days ago, they saw God part the Red Sea. Three days later. Let's just, just flip over there to, just, we're just going to do this together. They crossed the Red Sea in Exodus 14. Exodus 15, they'd been in the wilderness for three days and they got thirsty. They came to a pool at Mara and they couldn't drink the water because the water was bitter, okay? So they start grumbling and complaining. Look at verse 24. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? <coughs> Look what Moses did. Moses cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a log and he threw the log into the water, and the water became sweet. The people grumbled against Moses. Moses looked to the Lord. The Lord answered him, and he gave it to the people. See that exchange? Look at your next chapter, 16. This is 42 days later, because it says on the 15th day of the second month, and we were already three days in, 42 days later. Look at two. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses. You see it? Moses is dialing in. People are complaining to him. He's dialing in and he's listening. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go, shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. So the people saw God rain bread down from heaven, and they called it manna, which means, what is it? It really does. 
They didn't know what it was. We have in our head that it was like, a, like the communion crackers. You know, they go, go out every day and break off some communion crackers. No. You know what it was like? It was like Nilla wafers. God rained down Nilla wafers. You're like, how do you know that? Because the Bible says that. This isn't part of the sermon. I'm just going to tell it to you. Look at 31. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like what? Wafers. <laughs> Made with honey. Maybe a cross between a graham cracker and a Nilla wafer. It was good. The people ate it. And at night, God would send quail. So they're eating Nilla nil wafers in the morning and quail at night. And they're still complaining. Let's just, let's just do one more. Chapter 17, they come to a place called Horeb, and they're thirsty again. Look at 3. But the people thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill our children and our livestock with thirst? Look what Moses did. Moses cried to the Lord. What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And God said, there's a rock at Horeb, and when you go there, just strike it with your staff, and water is going to come out of it. The people watched Moses hit the rock with his staff, and water came out. Over a million people and livestock drank from it. They saw it. So now, that's the background. Let's come back to 32. We're back at the golden calf. The people grumble and complain. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together with Aaron, and they said, Up, make for us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them. Do you see it? It doesn't say, so Aaron Look to the Lord. Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Aaron said, you're complaining, I got this. Aaron was leading out of what would make his people happy. Hello? He wasn't asking God, where do you want to lead the people? He was leading on how to make them happy. This is slippery slope, people. Not only that, have you ever asked yourself this question? Why did Aaron make a golden calf? He could have made anything. Why did he make a calf? I can feel it. A little tension. It's okay. To know why they made a calf, you've got to go back to the years when they were in slavery. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today, by the way. I hope you're okay with that. But this word right here is the only thing that God promises that is not going to return void. Yeah. Everything else is just opinion. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at this book a lot. Why did he make a calf? Well, you've got to understand, when they were in captivity, Moses did the whole, let my people go. Pharaoh said no, and God started sending plagues. Remember this? First plague was blood in the river. He turned the river to blood. Remember that? Second plague was frogs. Yeah, Old Testament, come on. Third plague was gnats. Fourth plague was flies. And there's this interesting thing that happens after the fourth plague of flies. Pharaoh's like, okay, 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 okay. I can't handle the flies. He's like, Here's the deal, Moses. I'm not going to let you go, but I will let you take your people somewhere in the land to offer sacrifices to your God. Can we strike a deal and you take all these flies away? Okay? Just flip over to chapter 8. This is where this is happening. Chapter 8, verse 25. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron, and he said... Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said it would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God 
are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I'll let you go sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only do not go very far away and plead for me. Why would it be abominable to sacrifice in the land of Egypt? So abominable to the Egyptians, the Egyptians would kill them. Do you know why? Because in Egypt, they worshipped cows. And the Israelites were about to kill a bunch of cows. They're about to kill a bunch of the gods of the Egyptians, and that would have been abominable to the Egyptians, and they would have killed the Israelites. So they had to go three days. So when you come to the Mount Sinai, not only is Aaron leading out of what's going to make the people happy, but he's also leading based on how the world does it. Back when they were in slavery, As a leader in your church, how many decisions do we make based on how the world does something? From production to music styles. I've been doing this long enough to know that for a while every worship band sounded like U2 and then they sounded like Coldplay and then they sounded like Mumford and Sons. Hello. But like Aaron was talking about, we have the spirit of the living God in us to produce something excellent. Why are we looking at the world to do what they're doing? You want to know what the next big Christian concert's going to look like? Easy. Go watch Coldplay. Last year. I know I've been there. It's just so subtle. And here's what I want you to understand. We have an enemy. We have a very real enemy. And his goal is not to make you hate God. That would be too obvious. Because then you would go, oh, that's the enemy. His goal is not to make you hate God. It's to make you miss God. It's to make you take your eyes and your worship off the living God and put it onto something that we created. That's what the story of the golden calf is about. And you know what happens when that infiltrates our churches? It's right here in the story. Moses is up on the mountain. This is all happening down here. God tells Moses, your people are acting foolish, and I'm about to kill them all. Moses prays for his people, said, God, don't kill them. Just let me go down and try to straighten this out. That's really what happened. You can read it. And God said, okay, you have one chance. Go. So Moses is coming down the mountain. We're still in 32. Look at 17. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's the noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of a cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. What do your churches sound like? Do they sound like a people that are victorious? Are they shouting shouts of victory? Is it a people that is desperate and they realize how broken and lost they are in their sin and so they're crying for help? When you listen to your church, do you hear cries of victory or cries of help? Or do you just hear singing? I 
I know. It's just a question for you to ask as a leader. Just listen, dial in. Is it victory? Are we celebrating God? Are we really reaching out? Are we just singing songs? Because that's what we do. Because here's the deal. I believe with my whole heart that this generation, this worship generation, is right on the line. And if we don't fix it, then the next generation is going to lose it altogether. One of my favorite quotes in the whole world. It's not my favorite quote. My favorite quote is by a guy named Dave Busby that said, Jesus broke the rules when the rules are stupid. That's not the quote. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is by John Wesley, who said, what one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. What one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. You see it all through the Bible. You'll have a king who loves the Lord. He'll have a son who loves the Lord and he lets the people have idols in the temple. The next generation, idol worshipers. Happens time and time again. What one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. You see it today, you see it in government, you see it in the morality of our country, hello? What one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. You see it, every, you see it in country music. My generation tolerated Montgomery Gentry. <laughs> this generation embraces Sam Hunt. It's not your fault. <laughs> you don't know that there's not supposed to be rapping in country music. John Wesley knew what he was talking about. What one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. So if we don't fix this, creating worshipers of worship, then our next generation is going to lose it altogether. Are you with me? Yep. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we're about to shift gears. And I want you to know this. I have lost sleep over what I'm about to say. I have been on my face praying about what I'm gonna say, asking God to give me something else to tell you people. But he hasn't. So just bear with me. We're gonna jump into the deep end. In order for us to fix this, we have to come back to what the true biblical definition of worship is. Do you know what it is? Are you familiar with the passage in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2? This is your definition of worship. So we're like, oh, we're, what does worship mean? It's in the Bible, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And do not be conformed any longer to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God gave us a definition of worship. Let me ask you this. Where does Romans 12, 1 and 2 talk about singing? It doesn't. But yet we have a whole generation that defines worship by singing. Don't get me wrong. I love singing. I love singing. I love worshiping. Matt was talking about the importance of singing. It's important. When we sing, others are restored. We sing for others. People are restored. People get saved, people get healed. I was in Africa last year and in the middle of a worship service, a nine-year-old boy with a tumor in his stomach, his tumor went away. Just singing. There's power in it, we're supposed to sing. 
We're commanded to sing. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, thanksgiving in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, that's what Matt talked about. Don't be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, teaching one another songs, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord in your heart. We're supposed to sing, we're commanded to sing, but singing does not define our worship. Our worship is defined by the degree that we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. So why do we sing? We sing because we're commanded to. But we sing because singing is our expression of intimacy with the living God. I'm going to say it again. It's our expression of intimacy with the living God. We are the bride of Christ. This is our intimacy. We sing and something happens. It's our intimacy, but it doesn't define our worship. It's like this. It's like sex in marriage. I'm just going to say this. Just stick with me. If there's kids, just for five minutes. It's like sex in marriage. Sex is important in marriage. Sex consummates our marriage. Sex is vital to the health of our marriage. But it doesn't define our marriage. It's our expression of intimacy. It's how we're intimate with our mate, our husband, our wife. It doesn't define our marriage. Let me ask you married people a question. Don't answer out loud. (laughs) How much time during the week do you actually spend having sex? Single people, whatever you're thinking is wrong. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It's wrong. But it's so important. It's vital. It's your expression of intimacy. You have to. But that's not what defines your marriage. Your marriage is defined by all the other time during your week where you're sacrificing for your husband or wife and you're serving them and you're loving them. You're walking with them. That's what marriage is. And you express it through sex because it's intimate. That's what singing is, people. It's important. Hear me say that. It is so important. We're the bride of Christ. That's our intimacy. We're commanded to do it but it doesn't define our worship. Are y'all still okay? Because we're not even there yet. So about a month ago, I went to bed and I was just thinking about this and I was praying about this and I was praying about how our our generation clearly does define worship by singing. Worship was awesome today. No, singing was awesome today. Worship was thick today. I don't even know what that one means. I hear it all the time. It was thick. (laughs) I think what it means is that singing did something in our spirit and it was palpable. It was awesome. Singing was awesome. We have seeker-friendly worship. That's impossible. You can have seeker-friendly songs. You can't have seeker-friendly worship. It's hard to stand up in front of people and say, hey, guess what? Crucify yourselves. (laughs) That's not seeker-friendly, people. It's impossible. So I'm just thinking about this and I'm praying about it as I'm going to bed. I went to sleep and in the middle of the night about 3 a.m. I woke up 
broad eyed. And it was one of these panic moments. I was like, oh Lord. Because not only does our generation define worship by singing, stick with me. I started looking, I, I just got on my phone, I'm laying in bed, I started looking through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I started looking up worship. You could do it right now. Don't do it right now, but you could. Look up worship on social media. You know what you're going to see? Think about it. You've seen it. You know what you're going to see? You're going to see this big explosion. <laughs> Tons of people in a room. Lights. Smoke. LED walls. All this production. Hashtag worship. If singing is our expression of intimacy and what we're looking at every day, day in and day out is the glorification and the exploitation of our intimacy. You feel where I'm going? What do you call the glorification and the exploitation of intimacy. It's called pornography. Lord, just give us grace for just a minute. Please, Holy Spirit, just come give us grace. You know what the number one attack is on marriage today? It's pornography. Because our enemy understands that we're created for intimacy. So what he wants to do is he wants to take our eyes off of something pure and holy and put it on something that's a fake replica. And that's what we're doing in worship. We have the opportunity to introduce people to a God that when he speaks, universes come out of his mouth. He says, let there be light, and behold, there's light. It just comes out of his mouth. We can have intimacy with him, and you know what we're doing? We're going, we have an LED wall. Look, we can push this button, and it moves. Ooh. So you know what I did? I just Googled, started researching, what are the top five effects of pornography on our brains? I'm just gonna read these to you. I want you to interpret them in worship. Porn, this is number one. Porn means that you can't get aroused by just your spouse. Porn stimulates the arousal centers in the brain. And a chemical reaction happens and hormones, or hormones are released. In effect, our brains start to associate arousal with an image, an idea, or a video rather than a person. God forgive us. Number two, porn wrecks your libido. 
it's only natural then that people who have used porn in the past or used porn in the present virtually have no libido when it comes to making love to their spouse. The spouse is not what turns them on. And so the natural drive that we have for sex is transferred somewhere else. This is our generation, people. I just don't get anything when I read the Bible. When I'm spending time with the Lord, I just not get anything. But if you heard the new fill-in-the-blank CD, it just makes me feel so close to God. Number three, let's just keep going. I gotta get through this. Number three, an alcoholic, no, wait, three. Porn makes regular intercourse seem boring. An alcoholic drinks alcohol for the buzz, but after a while, your body begins to tolerate it. To get the same buzz, you need to drink more alcohol. And so the alcoholic begins to drink harder liquor or drink larger quantities. The same thing happens with porn. Because porn teaches us that sex is all about the body and it's not about intimacy. The only way to get a greater high is, and the same buzz is to watch weirder and weirder porn. Has anybody watched the worship movement over the last 20 years? Like Matt was saying the other day, we had songs like, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. We had to love you, Lord. And I could sing of your love forever. And hear me say this. I know we can't always sing those songs. I know that. I'm a songwriter. I've written a lot of songs. I get it. But there has to be this element of purity to it. where we're just leading people to Jesus. We can't just have a set list on a Sunday that has with everything in it three times. Well, we're gonna open with everything and then right before the preacher, we're gonna sing with everything and after we're gonna end with everything. Don't get me wrong, I love this song with everything. Joel Houston is a friend of mine. I wish I would've written with everything. But are you developing your people that you just gotta get past all the words so you can get to the whoa, because this feels awesome. We want to get to that part. It's an awesome song. But as a leader, when you're developing your people, don't just rush past all the first part because you know the O's are coming. Don't rush past. Open our eyes to see the things that make your heart cry to be the church that you would desire, your light to be seen. Break down our pride and all these walls that we've built up inside, our earthly crowns and all our desires we lay at your feet. So let hope rise and darkness tremble in your holy light. Then every I will see that Jesus is king. Oh, that song is awesome. Don't miss it for the buzz of those. As a leader, this is the line you walk when you're developing your people. Number four, let's keep going. Porn gives you a warped view of what attractive is. Sex is supposed to bond you physically, emotionally, and spiritually with your, pe- with your spouse. But if porn has made the chemical pathways in your brain go haywire, then sex becomes all about the body. And porn shows you that only a certain body type is attractive. It's not about the whole person, it's just about a certain type of person. Because Jesus said in John 4, 24, that an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Lord in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking people to worship like this. So what does God find attractive? Do you find the same things attractive that God finds attractive? Is that what fires you up? What does God find attractive? James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God is to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. 
God finds that attractive. Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you but to live justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? That's attractive to God. Is that what turns you on? Is that what fires you up? Widows and orphans and walking humbly? Or is it the songs? One more, and we're going to be done. Number five, porn causes selfishness and laziness. All of this causes a spiral of selfishness where the person ignores his spouse's needs and is focused only on getting what he wants and getting it instantly. Often this manifests itself in other areas of the relationship as well. Listen to this. Where the spouse becomes annoyed if they have to wait for something or if they don't get what they want. Porn has sold them a message that you deserve pleasure when you want it. You shouldn't have to work to get what you want. Your needs are paramount. Do you see it? This has been happening since the beginning of time. That's why the Israelites made a golden calf. Because they got tired of waiting. Moses was gone 40 days. They said, we don't know what happened to Moses. We're tired of waiting. Let's make gods. Because our enemy wants to take our worship off the living creator and cause our hearts to fall in love with what we created. And this is the tension that we live in. I want to be very clear. I don't think that there's one person in this place watching that intentionally is leading your people to love worship porn. I don't. I don't think it's intentional. I think we have a very crafty enemy. I do think that there's a generation full of leaders that are way more like Aaron than Moses. That we're leading, making decisions based off what's going to make our people happy? What's going to pe- keep people coming through the doors? What's going to keep this crowd here? How's the world doing it? What can we do to make it look awesome and do? I think there's a lot of errands. And what I'm going to ask you to consider is praying that God will give you the heart of Moses. That maybe you'll spend some time on your face asking God, how do you want to lead the people? Where do you want us to go? And lead out of that instead of what the people want. You know how the story ended? The golden calf? Remember this? Exodus 32. You still have your Bibles. Let's just, let's just end this way. Look at 9. As soon as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them on the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and he burned it with fire and he ground it to powder and he scattered it on the water and he made the people drink it. He didn't stop there. Kind of wish he would have, but he didn't. Look at 25. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. 92.1 92.1 K love, safe for the whole family. <laughs> it's not safe for the whole family, but it's good and it's right. Yeah. 
Some of you are action step people. You want an action step? Some of you leaders need to go get on your face before God. And you need to ask God, where do you want to lead these people? And then you need to get up and you need to evaluate what's going on in your church. And you need to kill some stuff. Not people. <laughs> Let the record show that I said not people. <laughs> no, but you need to kill some stuff in your program. You need to kill some stuff in your service. And you need to lead out of what God wants. Instead of this generational worship porn. Let me end with this story. Y'all knew who Matt Redman is? Yeah. Little short British guy. Hi, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's how Matt walks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Governor. Um, Matt's a good friend of mine, and I didn't know if this story was urban legend or if I could share it. So I, I actually reached out to him this week and we went back and forth. And first of all, I said, is this story true? And can I share it? He said, yes and yes. So when Matt was starting out, he was at this little tiny town near London called Watford, England. At Soul Survivor Church. Janet and I have been there. And Matt wrote a song called Blessed Be Your Name. Maybe you've heard of it. And Matt started writing these songs, and his songs started getting popular, and people started coming to Soul Survivor in Watford because of Matt Redman and because of his songs. And they weren't coming because they wanted to meet with a living God. And that's hard as a leader because now you've got all these people coming. It feels good. We're the popular church. Matt's pastor was this big Greek dude named Mike Pilavachi. Curly hair, always wore these crazy like shirts. Outgoing, awesome dude. And Mike observed what was going on in his church and the people were coming in for the music. And because Matt Redman was there, and not coming to meet with the living God. So you know what Mike did? He said, we're not going to have any more music in our church. When Matt Redmond's your worship leader, that's not necessarily the smartest decision to make. We're not going to have any music. In fact, I th I'm pretty sure that he took away chairs. When we were there, there were no chairs. And he said, we're going to create a church where people come to meet with the living God. They come to hear the word. And they can sing. There's not going to be a worship leader. And he just did away with all of it. For a season. No music. Soul Survivor Church. It was during that time that Matt wrote another song so that on the Sunday that Mike Pilavachi said, okay, we're going to introduce music back into this congregation slowly once he, once he thought that people were engaging with the living God. He let Matt get back up there. And so Matt walks up at the end of the service with an acoustic guitar. No band, no lights, no nothing. And he sang a song that says, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring you something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. Because you search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. 
I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, would you forgive our generation and would you have mercy on us? Would you stir in these leaders' hearts to give them the heart of Moses instead of the heart of Aaron? Would they be on their faces before you asking, God, where do you want to lead these people instead of, God, I'm just going to do this because it keeps the people happy. God, would you forgive us of the pornography of worship? Would you set our eyes on the living God and not on some fake replica that we have created? Jesus, it's all about you.